So uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, warm welcome to this webinar that we is organizing jointly with the ISP. Uh, my name is Saskia Slump. I'm working uh, at EFRAC here. So this webinar, we are going to discuss the ISB proposals for a new approach to developing disclosure requirements in IFRS standards. And I just heard Francois saying this will be a game changer. So that is what we count on So for our lively discussion. We will discuss the general approach and the proposed disclosures for IS-19 pensions, IFRS-30, unfair value management, and we have a panel so with panels of eminent experts, and you will see them. We will examine with them if the ISB proposals enable companies to enhance their judgment and reduce boilerplate information. And will it give investors useful information? That's the question as well that we have to address. So the panel discussions will be moderated by Michael Fechner. But first of all, I would like to express a warm welcome to Françoise Flores. We are delighted to have her here with us on her last day as ISB board member. So I can say, uh, Françoise, time flies. Uh, Françoise was six years EFRAC chair and EFRAC tech chair and my boss, and was 12 years on EFRAC tech. So we cannot really imagine that this will be her last day in financial reporting. I'm sure that our paths will cross at some stage again. So before we really start with the webinar, uh, some admin. So this uh, meeting is recorded, so it can be watched and listened afterwards, after the webinar. If you don't have the program or the slides or the bios, they are all on our website. So you just have to go to the calendar and then you go, uh, you click on it and you find everything you need. You will have the possibility to raise questions with all the people, uh, with all the speakers that are there. So there is a, a chat box at the bottom of your screen and you can enter there the questions during the whole of the webinar and we really encourage you to do so. Then in addition, we will have polling questions and you will get the first one or the first two ones, I think now on your screen. So they're addressing your background and so that we can see actually who is here in the audience. But also during the webinar in each of the panels, there will be polling questions. And it's really helpful to us if you could um, respond to those so that we can have an idea what you as audience are thinking. So I'm going to hand over to Francoise and Chiara Del Preta. Chiara is our EFRAC Tech Chair Women. She worked before at Massara at the Unique Credit Group in Italy and then Michael will do the rest of the work. He will moderate the three panel discussions and he will also introduce all the other speakers. Michael is um, uh, started just on our EFRAC board since the 1st of May. Uh, he was nominated by Business Europe and in his daily professional life, he work at DEMA. So I don't know if these questions um, have been answered. I think otherwise, um, we will go then for the moment um, to Francoise, who will start the discussions. And I think, Michael, you will then react to see what kind of audience we have once we get the results. So, Francoise, okay. I'm handing over to you. I said, delighted to see you on the screen and have you here. Thank you very much, Saskia, for your very kind introduction. And thank you um, to EFRAG more generally for organizing this uh, event with us in cooperation with us. Thank you to everyone involved in the panels, in the staff teams for having made this possible. And finally, thank you to the audience for their interest in our project. Without uh, any further word, uh, other than I'm presenting the board's proposals, but I do that uh, uh, and may uh, in one or the other aspect emphasize a view of my own. Uh, let's uh, dive into the subject now uh, and, and move directly into uh, slide five, please. And five slide five uh, uh, illustrates uh, what we know has been identified as the disclosure problem. That is, uh, uh, preparers who feel they're requested to provide information that uh, partly is of no interest to anybody. 
In the meantime, users who complain heavily in certain circumstances that they're lacking relevant information, that lack of relevant information may be misleading, and all this in a context of ineffective communication. So this problem, uh, on next slide please, has been identified long ago, and the priority in solving it has been identified twice in response to the ISP consultations in both 211 and 215. In the first uh, series of uh, standard setting efforts, the board has made its best effort in order to facilitate support the uh, effectiveness of materiality judgments because materiality is the key uh, player in reaching an appropriate uh, disclosure uh, uh, outcome. But that has not been deemed sufficient and uh, we have issued a number of proposals uh, investigating avenues to uh, uh, solve this disclosure problem in totality. Uh, and what we've heard very loud and clear is that we had to change the way we were setting requirements. What we had done was not enough. And uh, what is uh, identified as being the checklist mentality, the checklist attitude would not disappear unless we would dramatically change our requirements. So um, that's what we uh, uh, set ourselves to do. And on slide eight, uh, I can uh, uh, indicate, having been told that we had to change our approach, that what we set ourselves to do. So we thought, we, um, based on the feedback received in 2017 in particular, as to how we could uh, uh, set our disclosure requirements differently. We identified the guidance that is a standard setting guidance applicable to us. And we tested that guidance on two standards, one old one, IS-19, uh, a more recent one, IFS-13, both identified in different ways as in need for improvement on the disclosure front. Um, on that basis, we've been uh, uh, able to adjust uh, marginally our guidance and to prepare the exposure draft that we are consulting upon today. On the next slide, I would like to spend one minute thinking, reminding ourselves of what our current requirements mean. Our current requirements are a principle-based approach, based on one principle, which is the principle of materiality. Our current requirements include detailed prescriptive requirements for items of information. It also includes high-level disclosure objectives and overall disclosure requirements in IS-1. And all these are directed by the principle of materiality. So if today you ask yourself if having provided the full set of items of information that is in the disclosure checklist, so-called, so all the detailed items of information that are under prescriptive requirements in our standards, and you, be, you ask yourself whether you're in conformity with IFRS, you cannot say yes. You don't know. Because until the judgment, the materiality judgment has been exercised at the level of the disclosure objective, at the level of overall disclosure requirements, the answer is not known. So you cannot pretend as a preparer that you're in conformity, but you not, cannot give assurance as an auditor and you cannot enforce as a regulator. That being reminded to ourselves, we are in a principle-based approach based on materiality. What are the board proposals in this new approach? On next slide, uh, I identify the main features. Basically, we have decided to enhance uh, our stakeholder engagement to better understand, analyze, explain users' needs, and also with other stakeholders assess feasibility, cost, and enforceability. We have decided to develop objectives that describe the information that users need to be provided with, and those uh, objectives being able to be met only if proper judgment is exercised. 
And finally, we have selected language that we believe uh, is the, the, the language that will foster uh, the exercise of judgment so that will be a, a good basis for radical behavior change. We have, uh, uh, in, on the basis of our guidance, uh, as I said, prepared amendments to IS-19 and IFS-13. In addition to having the potential of being final amendments at some stage, when redeliberated and on the basis of the input uh, uh, received in this consultation, these amendments form an essential part of this consultation because they are the concrete basis to, uh, to uh, perform field work. And I would like to say that um, until field work is completed, I don't think that anybody can say that for sure what we propose will be successful. But nobody can say that this approach is due to failure unless the results of field work are used and known. So on the next uh, uh, slide, what exactly are we doing? When we say we emphasize, we enhance uh, our um, uh, stakeholder engagement and more particularly inquire in depth at an early age with users as to what they users needs are. We want to respond to the main issue that uh, we heard uh, as feedback is that when companies would like to exercise materiality judgment that don't have good enough basis to do so, or at least not good enough basis to do so and justify that they have done so. So we move to users, stop asking them what they would like to have. We ask them what they need and not only what they need, but why this information is needed, what should they be enabled to do with it and at what level of detail. And with that information gathered, we develop specific disclosure objectives that are accompanied by explanations of why this information should be provided, what should be done with it ultimately, or what should users be able to do with it. On the next slide, that uh, 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 illustrates what is needed to satisfy specific disclosure objectives. In our early outreaches on this project, we've heard things like, is this approach is not possible because preparers will be left with assessing uh, what users' needs are. We've heard preparers, this approach is not possible because preparers will be left with a blank sheet of paper. And on this slide, I hope I can demonstrate that neither is true. First of all, in designing specific disclosure objective, as, as just described, with explanation, explanations related to them that provide an understanding of what users should be enabled to do with the information provided, we as a board take full responsibility and nobody need to do anything else we take full responsibility for describing users' needs. Then we're not leaving preparers in front of a blank sheet of paper. We provide a full list of detailed items of information that are identified by ourselves as having the potential of helping meet a disclosure objective. And finally, we link all this together so that really uh, uh, we hope in doing this that we provide a sound basis for the exercise of materiality judgment in view of what the information is uh, uh, necessary. Just uh, 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 another element I would like to say, so I mentioned already uh, the checklist attitude, the checklist mentality, the checklist being the total list of detailed requirements, prescriptive requirements in our standards. I think when we look at the use that is done of this list today, it's not being used as a checklist. It's used as a to-do list. And that's where 
that's what we need absolutely to correct. But I would like to emphasize that this list still have a potential role to play as a checklist. What is a checklist? Basically, I'm a preparer. I understand what the information needed uh, will serve, what purpose it will serve. I know of my specific circumstances and I select, I identify the information that I should provide to meet the disclosure objective that I'm considering. I use the detail list as a checklist, that is to challenge my own judgment. I've made my judgment to be fresh and open eyes. I challenge my judgment with the checklist. So it does not lose its role and it does not lose its role in channeling and framing uh, and sound materiality judgments. Now, coming to the issue of language on the next slide, please. We have, in response to the feedback we've heard, your requirements are too prescriptive. This is what triggers the current problems. We have decided to move from uh, at the level of individual item of information, from the shall provide that item of information to uh, mandating that disclosure objectives are met and at the level of detailed item of information, introduce them by saying, why non-mandatory? When we have decided for this kind of vocabulary, why not mandatory? We are not sending the message to preparers. This is a full list of information that we have carefully prepared so that you can disregard it. We're just trying by the use of that language to emphasize even more that the information to be provided should be based on materiality judgments. And in fact, we are selected this language because we believe that this is what has the potential of changing behavior. It's difficult to change behaviors in this area, as in many other areas, but in this area in particular. And so we felt that we had to resort to this kind of language to achieve that objective. When I look at what our dissenters, we have three dissenters say, they agree with the diagnosis that the statu quo is no longer ten tenable. They agree that uh, preparers should be helped and everybody to make uh, and assert better materiality judgments. They agree with uh, resorting to specific disclosure objective and their general approach to do so. They disagree with the language because first they think that if we now provide a sound basis for the exercise of a materiality judgment, those uh, materiality judgment should be performed without difficulty and no other change is necessary. They also fear that the change of language will send the, the messages that people should not receive. So it's a question, the language is a question of how to change behaviors. In itself, it should not have any effect on the disclosure requirements themselves. So asking for having more shall than we uh, and less non uh is, in my own view, irrelevant. Now, uh, what are we trying to accomplish and what are the conditions to success? And that's what we see in the next slide, please. Basically, what we are doing with these proposals is kicking off a process for change. I just mentioned how difficult that behavioral change should be. But we are not going to be successful unless each and every stakeholder takes their part. And the first part that each and every stakeholder should take is to consider these proposals with fresh and open eyes. If you assess them without testing them, and in the light of your current experience, there is no progress possible, not with this approach, but not with any other approach. I would like also to highlight, and I do that as a former preparer, that if I achieve my judgment, if I exercise that judgment, 
I'm in a position to explain and justify that judgment. So the auditors and the enforcers that are going have responsibility for overseeing my work won't be faced with one, the notes to my financial statements, second, a blank statement. This is all the information needed because that's the only information material. They will be supplemented with proper justification for the selections made. Now, we've heard also some fears on the next slide that this approach could affect comparability negatively. And we know that every time judgment is exercised, there may be slight variations uh, in, in the way that is done. So you cannot uh, pretend that uh, everything is exactly the same. But is comparability anything like everything the same? No. That's the definition of uniformity. So if by requiring that Jud materiality judgments are better performed, that they are really carried out on some basis. We end up with sets of information which are more dissimilar than they are today. That would be a sign of success and not failure. Success because differences may be in additional information compared to today, and that would mean that at last relevant information that is lacking today is provided. And other differences may be because at last immaterial information ceases to obscure the real uh, 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 matter, the real relevant information, less immaterial information is provided. All these differences should appear. But we believe that in framing this disclosure objective, in providing the explanation as to why information is useful should be provided, what to what purpose it should be done, we believe that we frame, we channel judgment appropriately. And we would like to re re receive feedback on whether in doing that, but in substance, we are achieving this or that. And the fieldwork is the best place for these assessments. Finally, one word on the last slide, please, um, regarding taxonomy. This is also a, 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 an area where we heard concerns. And what we intend uh, uh, to see in taxonomy is an element to be created for each overall disclosure objective, specific disclosure uh, objective of these uh, requirements. And uh, uh, in fact, use block tagging in order to link as is done in the requirements, elements of information provided by an entity to the relevant uh, disclosure objective to which uh, those elements relate. In terms of the detailed items of information, all the detailed items of information that uh, uh, would be uh, um, supporting uh, the specific or general disclosure objectives in our standards would be tagged with the IFS taxonomies on a standard basis, exactly as it is today. So the question is, would companies be in a position to create more company extensions? And here again, if they do, that would be a sign of success because supplementary uh, 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 own extensions by company would mean that at last companies provide relevant information in addition to the list of detailed requirements which are specified in our standards, and they would start providing the relevant information that users are lacking. So I hope I have not overrun my time, but uh, uh, I thought the introduction to our proposal was necessary. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francoise. And then we'll move it to Chiara. Good morning to all of you. Um, can we go to the next uh, slide, to my first uh, uh, slide? 
so this is the overview of the project. Um, and uh, I would put the emphasis here on uh, something that Francoise already uh, highlighted, uh, uh, which is the need uh, to see how the work, uh, uh, how the project will work, uh, uh, this approach will work in practice. So uh, I'm starting with this slide, uh, uh, emphasizing the need uh, to uh, get on board the preparers uh, to test uh, uh, properly the proposals. Uh, we have issued uh, yesterday a reminder of uh, our call for participants. It's a field test joint with the ISP. Uh, the comment period ends uh, the 15th of October. Um, I will come back later on this on this point. Can we go to the next slide, please? So. Um, I will uh, illustrate the contents of EFRAG draft comment letter, which is the result of the preliminary uh, discussions held at the uh, EFRAG working groups, uh, EFRAG TAG and EFRAG board. Following uh, uh, the uh, outcome of our comment and the field test, uh, this position may, may change. Uh, first of all, we uh, welcome the development of a rigorous methodology to define objective-based disclosure requirements, uh, and we support the objective to develop uh, a guidance for the board and also test uh, with the, a pilot uh, whether these improvements would finally be effective. Uh, we also uh, uh, understand, and, and Francoise ex ex explained it very clearly, that the objective here is uh, not to reduce or increase the number, the volume of disclosures, but to uh, solve a communication problem and make the relevant disclosures uh, uh, more relevant disclosure and less irrelevant disclosure. So, uh, uh, and this is a very difficult task to tackle in, in practice. We uh, also continue to hold the view that we expressed already in 2017 that developing and testing this approach has merit and has to be encouraged because we support the reduction of the checklist mentality and the disclosure checklists. And uh, we appreciate in particular the proposal to work more closely with users uh, earlier in the standard setting process to better articulate how the information will serve the needs of the users. We also uh, uh, observe, though, that the exposure draft does not explain the relationship between the individual objectives in, this, in the standards and the overall concept of materiality, an element that, as also Francoise was illustrating, is key. So we recommend that the ISB further explain this relationship, as this is essential to co correctly understand the uh, proposals. The specific objectives uh, are developed uh, on the basis of the decision usefulness for users. And we also suggest to the ISB to consider how these objectives would serve also the stewardship objective of the financial reporting. And finally, we encourage uh, to further consider the interaction between these proposals and the increased use of digital technology as comparability of the information can be seen as a prerequisite for an effective use of the technology-based reporting. Can we go to the next slide, please? And here it comes uh, a key question to constituents in our draft comment letter, which is a bit the uh, reflection, ref the, 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 the result of the status of the discussion, uh, initial discussion for this proposal. And the question is whether uh, the constituents agree that the ISB should only mandate the overall and specific objectives, uh, or should there be a list of minimum disclosure requirements? And why we have included this question? Uh, first of all, because the proposed uh, approach increases the emphasis on the requirement to meet a disclosure objective rather than on a particular uh, item uh, to, be disclosed, to be disclosed. And in most cases, the ISB expects that uh, only lists of non-mandatory items uh, will be uh, included. And so this is a radical change from the existing guidance 
and basically uh, uh, put it very in simple terms this could make the minimum requirements an exception and we note that the users of financial statements have uh, consistently highlighted the importance of both entity specific information and comparable information and we consider that uh, by focusing the objectives on uh, the provision of entity specific information and a higher level of judgment, the proposal may create implementation challenges and tensions with comparability. So although we support the reduction of a detailed checklist disclosure, we do not support the classification of certain disclosures as non-mandatory or making a minimum requirements an exception. So in a nutshell, the success of this proposed approach will depend on the ISB striking the correct balance between a tier of disclosure that are always required to ensure a man minimum level of comparability and objectives to elicit additional entity specific disclosures. And we are concerned that absent a list of minimum disclosure requirements, the proposed approach would expose preparers to second guessing and it would also make the review by the auditors and the forces more challenge, challenging. So you see that this question is a bit re the, the result of a long debate that we had uh, in our uh, discussions leading to the draft comment letter and expresses a bit the cautious with which we are looking at the proposals at this stage. Can we go to the next slide, please? Other challenges. Uh, Francoise uh, uh, highlighted uh, that the use of this less prescriptive language, language is an element uh, of the debate and, and has also been a bit contentious already at the ISB level. And we indeed are concerned that if the objectives are not specific enough, the expression, while non-mandatory, could be misunderstood. Therefore, we suggest the ASB to clarify in the body of the proposed uh, amendments that this expression doesn't mean that the items of information are voluntary, so that the entity, uh, sh sh and the entity should consider these items when assessing meeting the specific objectives. We also consider that the use of the proposed less prescriptive language may create enforceability and auditability issues. Uh, because they put too much uh, le uh, emphasis on the level of judgment by preparers. Uh, we also are uh, uh, concerned that uh, different uh, users may have different information needs, for example, equity investors or lenders, but also the users may have different uh, needs over time, spe especially in uh, troubled times. So assessing a common information need for a variety of users and considering the dynamic nature of the, of the needs over time may be a real challenge for preparers, auditors and enforcers. Next slide, please. And now we come to a key element uh, of the process, which is the field test, as I was saying at the beginning. Uh, it's clear that these, uh, um, these new guidance may represent a game changer, very innovative approach, but the uh, actual result cannot really be predicted without uh, uh, a detailed uh, uh, and significant field test, because the real effect will depend on the behavior of the preparers. I give you an example. Uh, it will really depend on the willingness of the preparers to undertake this change uh, and the change to their approach to the use of judgment. In some cases, a tendency to maintain the existing requirement or even to increase the disclosure cannot be excluded. Uh, think, for example, to the smaller entities with less resources and less sophisticated resources dealing with disclosure. So assessing the cost benefit profile will be very important in order to confirm the validity of the proposals. So we hope we can have a final letter uh, much more positive and supporting uh, following uh, the evidence that we need to get during this test.
looking at the uh, IFRS 13 and 19, uh, in particular, when assessing the benefits, we would like to be really sure that there are no uh, information that get lost in this process, and so that we can identify an appropriate set of minimum requirements, at least from the pilots prepared by the people. Uh, in terms of the comment period, a final word from my side, we have suggested to the IISB to allow us a longer comment period because assessing these uh, disclosures is really key. And so we need to have a good number of preparers and to have the time also to approach other stakeholders because, as Francois says, it's a collective uh, effort if we want to succeed, uh, involving also the auditors, uh, the uh, enforcers, in addition to the users and the preparers. This is all from my side, and uh, I hope you have a good debate, and we will, uh, I will debrief uh, your uh, conversation and debate at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you very much, Francoise, for your insights and on the ISB proposal and FRAC's views on that. Uh, now, before we introduce our first set of high-quality panelists, um, let's have a look at the first two polling questions, and uh, we, you should also see on the screen shortly uh, polling questions uh, number three and four for the audience. Um, with the professional background, which we asked in the polling question, we see that we have a large stake of preparers and the accountancy professions. We also have users and academics and professional organization on board. Uh, and also some regulators and uh, for for others. Um, by looking at the geographical set of our audience, uh, we can see that uh, Germany has the highest stake, uh, uh, followed by uh, other EU countries, Scandinavia as 14%, France, Belgium. Uh, so welcome to all of you. So, as you said, Francoise, we'll, we'll have a game changer. Kara, you said it too. We need um, a change in the behavior of basically every party involved. Uh, so, I'm very glad to have a high quality set of panelists for the first round of panel discussions. Uh, before I go into the introduction, let me remind you that you always have the option to ask questions uh, using the chat box uh, on the screen below, and we'll try to address every question that you ask, and you're really, um, really uh, appreciated if you send us your questions. Now, for our first set of panelists, uh, let me welcome Nicholas Grip. Nicholas is a uh, senior vice president and the head of regulatory strategies at Group Finance within Svenska Handelsbanken. Uh, he's also a member of the European Bankers Association and the technical expert group of the Swedish Standard Center where he chairs the Working Group for Financial Instruments, Insurance and Liabilities. And uh, we know Nicholas also from EFRAC, where he's the vice chair of EFRAC Tech and uh, the chairman of the EFRAC Pension Plans Advisory Panel. So welcome, Nicholas. Uh, next up, we'll have Malgozata Matusevic. Matusevich, sorry, I, I hope I got that right. Thank you very much. She's an associate partner at the IFRS desk in EY Poland, and she's working for a variety of industries in her role uh, across from retail, real estate, uh, media and entertainment uh, to banking and asset management. So she's got a wide variety of experience. We also have Isabel grauer Gaynor from the Enforcer side. Isabel is the team leader of the corporate finance and reporting team at ESMA, uh, where she joined uh, in 2019. Uh, she's a French chartered accountant who also worked at Mossas before, uh, and she has also been a technical director at the French Accounting Standard Center, ANC, and has worked also with PWC in various roles, I understand. So welcome, Isabel. And uh, for the uh, last but not least, of course, for the first set of panelists, we have Dennis Ullens. Dennis is a lecturer in accounting and finance at the Accountancy and Control Group of the Amsterdam Business School uh, with more than 20 years of experience in banking. And he is a member of the Capital Markets Advisory Committee of the ISB 
and member of FRAC's user panel. So welcome to you all. Uh, Nicholas, if I can kick it off with you, um, what do you think about the proposed approach by the ISB? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I, I listened to what Francoise said, uh, and I'm really glad for the explanations she gave in her introductory speak, speech. But, however, I think it's actually the words in the ED that we are evaluating and not the intent of the ISB board. So, so, so the comments I will give here is how I understand the ED and not what Francoise said what supposed to be in the ED. So, yes, for <laughs> perhaps commenting on things that she already had said is not relevant. But, but anyways, so, so to, to start with, I, I really support objective-based standards. I, I believe that's the, the right way forward. Uh, and initially, when, when I looked at, at the ED, uh, my, my conclusion was that it's important to, to try to write balance between the general objectives and the detailed guidance but the way the ED was structured, I, I believe it's failed in that respect. But presently, after have, having read the, the, the ED for a couple of times, I, I believe it's a quite good balance between the, the shall and may requirements in the details of IS-19 and IS-13. Uh, but, but the problem is the wording again. It, the, the, the drafting says that, that the preparer should consider all detailed requirements that any user may consider material. Uh, and in practice, it means that the preparers need to prove that these needs have been considered in some way. They need to consider what might be relevant in the future as well, because what's not material at the reporting date might be relevant the, the coming year. So you need to include that to have time series and so on. And when preparers ask users, they always said more is better. So it's, it's extremely difficult based on the wording to, to really make sure that as a preparer that you have fulfilled the requirements in the ED. I, I think it could be compared, the ED could be compared to IFRS 7 that actually have some objectives today. If I take one quote from IFRS 7 uh, is enable users to evaluate. And another quote is if the entity believes. The ED says entities would be required to disclose all material information needed to meet the detailed user information needs and may need to disclose information in addition to that identified in the standard. So, so the ED focuses on all material needs and add to that what's included in the standard may not be sufficient. I think that combination makes it really difficult for preparers to achieve the objectives of the standard compared to what we have in IFRS 17 that focus on what the preparer believes is relevant. Uh, and I believe that it, not everyone likes IFRS 7, but still, it's why I think it was the first objective-based standard, so that's why I'm using it. So, so I think that IFRS 7 focuses on achieving an understanding on the risks within the entity and not requiring it to provide all possible information that may be of interest for the users. Uh, so for me, to, to really, if you literally want to follow the ED, I believe that the preparers would need to be do an outreach before each quarter reporting that they present. So, 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 so for, for me, and I think I expressed that in other comment letters, the ISP should require the preparers to do its, do its best based on its understanding of what the users needs and not really require it to present everything that any user may consider to be material. So, um, so to conclude, I really believe that objective-based disclosures is the right way for the future. But the focus needs to be on what the entity believes is the useful information for the users. So if there were some just small amendments of the choice of words in the general description in the ED, I believe that, the, as Chiara said, it has been some hesitation with regards to, to the ED presently, and we hope that we will be able to, to write more positively in our final comma letter. So if we make those amendments from, from any material need to what the preparer believes is relevant. I believe it's a pretty good track balance presently in the ED with regards to the detail requirements. 
So, so based on that, I think it could be workable. So that's really what I wanted to say, and I think I might spare some one or two minutes for, for others here. Thank you very much, Niklas. Um, when you say uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of judgment and a lot of outreach, um, I, in my mind, the first question that pops up is how do we deal with the auditors in that instance? So let me ask Malgozata, what are your thoughts on the proposals? Thank you, Michael. Well, I would start with saying that we all agree that the checklist approach does not work. But I also think that this is a valid question, whether this is actually an issue of improper application or insufficient enforcement of existing standards, or rather an issue with the standards themselves. And although I don't think that there is a simple and, uh, you know, unambiguous answer to this question, I am in fact convinced that without further standard setting, it will be very difficult, if not unfeasible, to solve this problem. So overall, I really support this project because I think it really can be very helpful to somehow kick off the change in mindset. Because in fact, as already Chiara mentioned, the biggest challenge with these proposals will be uh, that it, it requires behavioral changes to work. Uh, and this needs to be, in fact, a joint effort of the ISB preparers, enforcers. So we all need the willingness to change uh, our thinking uh, to make things happen. Uh, but coming back to the proposals themselves, I overall support the objectives-based approach uh, as well. I very much appreciate the fact that users were involved in developing this guidance at very early stage. I also think that explaining directly in the standards how the specific information can be used by users or why they are useful for users is, is very helpful. I think it really adds value and and, and can really support behavioral changes. Uh, this, this puts things into broader perspective. But I also do have some concerns with these proposals. Uh, overall, I'm afraid that moving far away from checklists uh, may not work for, for several reasons. First, I share the concern that uh, the more judgment uh, is required, uh, the more uh, incomparability there may be, because entities may simply execute the judgment differently, although facts and circumstances may be pretty similar. Uh, I also sometimes feel that this proposal uh, may require unrealistic effort from the preparers. In particular, for medium entities, smaller entities, it may be very challenging to look through the lenses of users. I think Niklas touched upon on that uh, as well. So I also have concerns that it may happen that nothing will change, so that the entities will, will simply use the proposed disclosures as you know, another kind of checklist. And finally, as an, as an auditor, I have concerns with auditability, um, because the more judgment is required, the more difficult uh, it is to audit them. I personally have some concerns with differentiating between mandatory and non-mandatory disclosures. Uh, but I think I can elaborate on that a, a, a bit more when we will discuss proposed amendments to IS-19. Still, I hope these concerns can be overcome during the standard setting process and probably also by shifting the mindset. Uh, and, and this project is simply worth a try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malgozata. And you mentioned it, it require, the proposal would require a, a change in the mindset of all the parties involved. Uh, let me ask Isabel from ESMA, from an enforcer perspective, what are your thoughts about the proposed general approach? Um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so ESMA uh, supports uh, the ISB's ambition and objectives to improve the quality uh, of the disclosures provided by preparers of IFRS financial statements. Uh, and that is because uh, European enforcers observe that financial statements frequently uh, do not contain material information which would be of relevance to users, and on the other hand, uh, contain lengthy, boilerplate and non-entity specific disclosures that do not serve the information needs of users of financial statements. And, uh, uh, and that is actually despite the fact that we've been insisting and in trying to play our own role um, uh, in our latest statements of insisting that um, uh, issuers should uh, go for entity-specific disclosure, relevant disclosures. Um, 
We do believe, though, that the so-called disclosure problem is only partly caused uh, by the way IFRS are written, uh, such as the existence of prescriptive lists of disclosures. Um, in our view, the problem is rather behavioural, as was highlighted by previous speakers, um, with how entities use such lists by applying or rather not applying materiality judgment. Um, so in this respect, I'd like to note uh, that you know, existing IFRS requirements um, already, already suffice uh, for those entities who thoughtfully apply materiality judgment and provide relevant and decision useful information to users because these preparers already understand that it is not required to provide disclosure for non-material elements. Um, so in that view, you know, we don't think a radical rethink of the way in which IFRS are written is warranted. Um, we welcome the development of general and of detailed uh, disclosure objectives, as we expect that those will indeed help preparers better apply materiality judgments. Um, but we do not favour the proposal not to include detailed disclosure requirements, but only providing examples which are not mandatory to, uh, to disclose. Uh, we understand the ISB is aiming uh, to achieve a culture shift, uh, but we think that this approach is too risky and, and goes too far. Um, we strongly believe that the ISB should continue to include in disclosure standards a list of minimum disclosures, which is mandatory. Uh, and for these disclosures, the general materiality principle of IS1 uh, would be applicable, just like it is today. Um, and information would only need to be disclosed, therefore, if mater material to the entity. Um, and finally, we're also aware of concerns that the proposals in the ED could lead to decreased comparability, and we do understand the difference between comparability and uniformity, as, as Francoise highlighted. Um, and, but, but we believe that such concerns would be addressed if the future standards strike the right balance between detail requirements and requirements to comply with objectives. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Isabel. And to round off uh, our first set of panelists, uh, let me ask Dennis. Um, uh, well, users tend to ask for more and more information. What do you think about the effort to make information in the financial statements more relevant? Okay. Um, thank you, Michael. Yeah. So. I spent uh, 15 years as a user within um, equity research, uh, and I want to make a few observations. The first one is that, although I am a user uh, with an equity hat on, there are many different types of users. So you can talk about equity investors, analysts, fixed income investors, analysts, and even within those categories, there are people who will use information differently, so and will use different bits of information. So it's, it's challenging, I think, for a standard setter to say uh, there is a user of financial statements because there are many, many different types of users who will use information differently and will use different information. Now, uh, the second uh, observation is often the question is, do uh, companies know what users want? Now, I think for big listed companies with large investor relations departments who frequently talk to their investors and analysts, they will know what the users want at a particular moment in time. The question is, however, do users know what they want in terms of information? Uh, because that information need varies over time. Uh, so Chiara referred to the economic cycle, but we only have to have to go back to the economic crisis, into uh, the, the credit crisis in 2008, where all of a sudden banks had to disclose their CDO and their CLO holdings, or European crisis where banks had to disclose their Greek bond positions, or even recently where we were asked to, uh, where companies were asked to disclose supply chain financing based on the demise of Carillion in the UK. So it's also very difficult to say there is a static information set. The information set is going to be dynamic. Uh, so that makes it very difficult, I would argue, to put the onus on preparers to say this is it at a specific moment in time, uh, the information that the users uh, want. Now, uh, finally, building on uh, some of the observations that were made earlier, uh, Clearly, we refer to the annual report and refer to the financial statements, but we don't read them from, um, from front to back, do we? 
uh, we pick and choose, we refer to it when we need uh, particular bits of information to piece together the puzzle of, in an equity setting, uh, make forecasts and derive evaluation. So you won't hear, building on your question, Michael, you won't hear many users complain of disclosure overload, right? There is uh, the distinction between what is nice to have and need to have is, uh, you know, it's like, I don't want to say it's like your children, but they, they want a bit of both. Uh, so it's very difficult, I find, to say what is need to know versus nice to know, given the way we use uh, financial statements. Now, finally, yeah, the issue of comparability crops up uh, frequently. And I think that is a bit of a concern. So I think I would echo uh, Isabel's comment and also comments made earlier that, you know, minimum required uh, disclosure items, uh, a list of minimum required items would um, hopefully compensate for the potential lack of um, comparability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dennis, maybe one follow-up question uh, to what you just said is that uh, the, the information needs of users tend to vary, vary um, over time. Uh, so would it mean from your perspective that the objectives that are then presented or uh, um, contained in the IFRS standards for disclosures would need to vary as well? Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether the uh, objectives need to vary because it's, uh, I can imagine it's very difficult to amend that on an interim quarterly annual basis. Uh, but at least having a, a minimum required disclosures could basically see to it that on certain areas you will always have you know, the minimum bit of information. So we're going to talk about IS-19. You could argue if you at least have you know, a specific set of information pr pr provided uh, for every accounting period, then that would provide you with information you need when pensions all of a sudden becomes a, a real issue for corporates. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis. So let's have a quick look um, on the polling questions. A question that we asked to our audience was, do you think that the ISB should further emphasize the need for entities to exercise materiality judgments? And there we have a answer A with about 60%. Yes, the current approach leads to a checklist attitude that provides false assurance of, of conformity and contributes to the lack of relevant information in the notes, uh, followed by answer C with 22%. No, in our current environment, justifying materiality judgments for disclosures is not feasible. Emphasizing this will develop further difficulties for entities, auditors, and regulators as well. Uh, and then we have 19% for no IFRS already requires the exercise of judgment about materiality and no further emphasis is needed. So clear support here. Uh, for the second question, uh, do you agree with the ISB approach of mandating all disclosures by way of overall and specific disclosure requirements? There we have a vast majority, uh, not, it's not a majority, but it's 44% of all the answers, uh, biggest answer, largest answer here, is no certain prescriptive requirements to disclose particular items of information are required in each standard to ensure some level of uniformity of information provided across company. I think that's also something that we have heard. But also rank number two would be 26% Yes, this will improve the relevance of the disclosures provided and then followed equally by a yes and no answer. All right, let me stay with Dennis. And for the audience, you should have already had the next polling questions on your screen. Thank you very much for your contribution. Let me stay with Dennis. Um, also, um, many people mentioned the digitalization and the impact on financial, in, uh, on financial statements. How do you expect digitalization to impact the analysis by users? Uh, thank you. Well, to put in the health warning, uh, I'm old school, so I, I print off PDFs and put numbers in Excel sheets and all that. And so probably not the best person to ask on what's the state of art today. But um, clearly we're, we're helped by companies to some extent because some companies kindly put Excel sheets with their financial statements uh, on the investor relations uh, website. So that helps. Uh, clearly, uh, moving to uh, ESEF, XBRL, uh, would make life for um, analysts and investors so much easier. 
Um, so I think that would be pretty, a pretty obvious statement. As I said, I'm, I'm interested perhaps also in other panelists' view on uh, what that mean for what that would mean for uh, the prepare perspective. Also, where we would investors and analysts access that information? Would there be a central central depository? Uh, but clearly, uh, a, a big step forward uh, as if and when it arrives, hopefully in 18 months too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. So coming back to Malgozata, um, IFRS 9, 15, 16, they all have disclosure objectives and there are disclosure objectives also already in IS 19 and IFRS 13. Um, Malgozata, do you have any experience to share with us on whether these objectives are useful in discussions around quality of disclosures at the moment? Uh, indeed, I think this is a good moment to reflect on whether the already existing defined objectives in existing standards are useful and, and whether they actually do make a difference. From my experience, they can be sometimes really helpful in assessing the disclosure quality, in discussion with clients on certain disclosures. And in this context, the first standard which comes to my mind is actually IFRS 7, so the one on disclosures around financial instruments. Because in my view, the way this standard defines disclosure objectives really helps. Let's take, for example, liquidity risk. Liquidity risk disclosures are often uh, important and sensitive, uh, and sensitive uh, in particular during pandemic. And when I need to assess the quality of uh, liquidity disclosures, I look not only at what's you know, literally required by the standard, but I find it very helpful to refer to disclosure objectives in IFRS 7. And I ask myself a question. Considering what I know about this entity as an auditor, do these specific disclosures really enable to evaluate the nature and extent of liquidity risks to which this specific entity is exposed? Do they really enable to understand how the entity manages the risk? And, and those are the objectives defined by IFRS 7. And so by referring to these objectives, I can make a meaningful uh, assessment. And in a case like that, checklists don't work because it's not possible to put all potential issues, considerations around liquidity together as a list. So in my view, IFRS 7 works, works well by defining both overall disclosure objectives and some specific disclosure requirements, which, however, are, are not uh, exhaustive. What may be tough, though, is that my understanding what information needs to be disclosed to meet disclosure objectives may be very different from that of, of the client. I also observe a kind of resistance to disclose anything on top of what is literally required uh, by the standards. And actually, regardless whether there are defined disclosure objectives in a given standard or not, a checklist mindset is predominant. It's quite unusual to look at disclosure objectives to determine which information to disclose. And this all makes objective-based discussions around quality of disclosure is very difficult. The more judgment is required, the more enforceability becomes uh, an issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabel, from an enforcer perspective, uh, do you consider the proposed wording sufficient to help you in cases where a preparer followed a thorough decision-making process, but in the end you disagree with the outcome? Uh, I think I already hinted at that in my previous answer, so short answers, no. We don't think that the proposed wording is sufficient to ensure enforceability of the disclosure standards. Um, and why is that? I actually sympathize a lot with Ma what uh, Margaret Zata explained. I mean, you know, enforcers are the third line of defense, and we have even less information available to us. We don't carry out audits. Of, uh, of financial statements, and so for us, it's we're placed in a in, in a much more difficult uh, position even than auditors. Um, so we're concerned that should the ISB proceed with the approach in the ED, uh, the hurdle for us as enforcers to require relevant disclosure from issuers, uh, and from those issuers specifically who are not willing to be transparent, would be really too high. Um, in the absence of specific disclosure requirements, it's difficult or it's likely to be difficult to conclude that the judgment made by the preparer is not reasonable and that specific information is needed uh, to fulfill a certain objective. 
And in that respect, I'd like to highlight the important role that the ISB actually plays through its due process uh, in assessing what the common needs of users are and preparing a potential list of disclosures which it would expect to be relevant and material. Um, uh, and obviously, as I mentioned before, in our view, uh, such list of disclosures should be mandatory for all material items. I understand what Dennis said about different sets of, of users um, who, who, who would want uh, different uh, types of information, um, but um, I still think uh, the ISB plays an important role in defining what those common needs would be. Um, and going back to, to the wording, we think that the use of the phrase non-mandatory may actually prompt reporting entities to limit the amount of information disclosed, regardless of its materiality and relevance to users. Uh, we don't see the benefit of remarking that immaterial or non-relevant information is not mandatory, because that is already the case today. Um, so we would favour uh, using a wording similar to the wording that's used in existing standards, uh, such as to meet the objective in paragraph X, um, an entity shall disclose this, that and the other. Um, and uh, already, as already mentioned for these disclosures, um, the general materiality principle in IS-1 uh, would be applicable just as it is today, uh, meaning information would only need to be disclosed if it is material to the entity. So, so we, do, we do have concerns with uh, the um, enforceability of the approach just proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, also on the wording, Niklas, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, and especially with focus on discussing on your judgments and decisions with the auditors and enforcers. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, if you remember what I said earlier, uh, I think if you adjust the, the wording in the, the in, in the way I, I try to, to 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 argue for, I, I believe that it would be quite a natural, straightforward discussions with auditors and enforcers if you have a company that want to display relevant information, <laughs> which I believe I work at, uh, but because I think already today a company, the company I work. At, when we implemented IFRS, IFRS in 2005, the main standard for us with regards to disclosure was IFRS 7, with, uh, since we are a financial institution. Uh, and there we really tried to fulfill the objectives of the disclosure requirements, uh, and we structured the notes in such a way that we believe that we achieved that. Initially in that discussion, we had, a, happily enough, four different audit firms and auditors back then, uh, and a regular aud audit as well. Uh, it was a lot of discussions, but, but, but uh, after a while, the, the first year and so on, I, I think everyone was happy with the, the way we structured our, our notes based on those objectives. And uh, nowadays we see others that have done it in, in a similar way that, that we have. So, so it's not the problem at all to kind of focus on those objective-based disclosures if you want to, to, to give a, a good picture of your company that we believe is worthwhile to have a good valuation <laughs> and low funding cost and so on. But, but I, I believe if the wording indeed will be kept, I am afraid that the discussions will be much more difficult. As I mentioned, if we should prove in some way, document that, that we have considered all possible needs from, from the users, that will be a discussion then with the auditors that want to see that documentation and enforcers will ask for it afterwards and so on. So, so that may create a, a, a feeling of being afraid of disclosing too little, that, that kind of may lead to, to a checklist behavior that we start to disclose more than we have done previously, because it's not our view on what's material, it's the possible view of others, what they consider to be material, that need to be disclosed. So, so, so I'm afraid of clutter and more information than previous based on the way that the gender guidance is written. Thank you. Michael, I don't hear you. Is it just me or? Ah, no, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I, I thought I needed to do that once in a in a webinar. Um, <laughs> so done. Uh, check, checklist checked off. 
Um, so I take it from, from what you say is that it's more likely that the costs to prepare the disclosures are, well, likely to increase. And uh, that leaves the question of the cost-benefit analysis. And uh, let me take that as a hint towards our fifth polling question that we rose, uh, where we asked our audience, uh, do you think that the benefits of the proposals would outweigh the costs? Uh, well, we have 52% uh, answering with C. No, the costs will increase, and the likely improvement in financial reporting would not be sufficient to justify this. While 26% say, yes, the benefits of the proposals will outweigh the cost implications. And uh, even 23% say, yes, the proposals will not have significant cost implications. Okay, uh, that's quite interesting. And we had another polling question, the proposals aim to improving the relevance of disclosure, but some are concerned that comparability within and across sectors would decline. Do you think that comparability would be impaired by the proposals? Well, we have 45% saying, yes, the objective-based nature of the requirements will remain. That will mean that companies will, for which uh, similar information is material will disclose different things. While 32% uh, say, no, the proposals require companies to disclose the material information to satisfy objectives uh, and the related tools to determine what is material. And 23% uh, say, no, the proposals will not have the intended impact and stakeholders will still follow a checklist approach. So also something that we have heard already uh, in the panel. So then uh, let's move it to, uh, let me first thank you to all the panelists for your views. Um, we have two questions from the audience and I'm happy to have Catherine Donkersley from the ISB technical staff here on board. Uh, she will also present later on. And uh, she's also the project lead of the disclosure initiative uh, that resulted in the exposure draft that we are just discussing today. So, Catherine, welcome at first. And secondly, uh, there is one question on uh, the wording. Could the words, while not mandatory, be explained to mean comply or explain? Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you to, to the audience member. That's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is no, that is not how those words are intended at all. And in fact, the board really carefully considered different wording options um, and landed on that one as, as, as a way to, to, to communicate that. Um, I will expand slightly because there has been some discussion amongst the panel of this concept of minimum requirements, which is very related. And the compliance requirement with the proposals in the exposure draft is to provide information to satisfy the disclosure objectives. So in terms of minimum requirements, the minimum requirement is meet the objective. It, it, it's not about minimum items. Um, and in terms of meeting those objectives, one other thing that I thought it might be helpful to clarify is that the board very carefully phrased the objectives as a requirement to disclose information that enables a user to understand. And the reason it did that is because the board is not expecting a company to be accountable for the actual analysis that users perform. Instead, the board has challenged itself to clearly communicate the common um, needs of users in the standards based on a lot of research so that a company can understand those user needs from the standards without having to go and talk to all of its investors. And then the compliance requirement or the, the minimum requirement is to provide information to enable the, the, the item in question to be understood, so, so that, that user need. Um, so just a, a, a few things that, that I wanted to mention in response to, to that answer. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Another question that has reached us from the audience was regarding with the uh, influence or the, the cooperation with the European Central Bank as a supervisor. Um, and the question was, has the EC, ECB uh, in being involved in drafting the proposals? Um, so, so, so they weren't involved in, in drafting. What, what I would say is that given that IFRS 13 was picked as an example, and, and we'll get onto this later in the webinar, I'm, I'm sure, um, the, the 
matters specific to banks were very much considered by the board in developing the proposals. So the best example of that is that we took back to the board discussion several times this whole concept of, of a reconciliation for, from opening to closing uh, level three fair value measurements, precisely because some of the information there is, is so relevant to, to, to banks in a regulatory sense. So, so um, those kinds of matters were, were absolutely factored into the proposals. All right. Thank you very much, Catherine. And now, since we're already a bit behind time, um, let me just hand over to you again, Catherine, to uh, present uh, the proposals regarding the amendments to IS-19 employee benefits. And we'll also welcome Katrin Schöne. Uh, Katrin is the project director at EFRAC, and uh, she reports to our EFRAC tech chairwoman, Chiara, and uh, leads uh, the technical activities on a portfolio of projects. Uh, Catherine, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much again, Michael. Um, so with regard to employee benefits, what I'm going to do is focus on defined benefit plans um, because a key message coming out of all of the board's outreach on this test standard was that defined benefit plans are where the risk is and where users are, are most interested. Um, so the board heard that the single most important information to users about defined benefit plans is often their cash flow effects, but users often say they get little information on this today. Um, another problem we heard uh, relates to ineffective communication. So we hear that users receive pages of detailed pension disclosures, but they can't always piece together the information they see and understand how it relates to the primary financial statements. At the same time, companies tell us that those detailed pages of information can be onerous to prepare. Putting all of that together, everything we've heard suggests that applying the proposed approach to IAS 19 could have some real benefits for all stakeholders. It could help companies to avoid spending time preparing disclosures that are not providing the most useful information. And it could also result in information for investors that is more relevant and more effectively communicated than they currently receive. The next slide summarises at a high level uh, the six specific disclosure objectives that the board has proposed for defined benefit plans. And by way of reminder, these are the objectives that a company is required to satisfy. Um, now, they respond directly to the feedback we heard. Um, you'll see, for example, um, an objective that directly captures that user information need for clear and effective communication that some have described as an executive summary. And you'll see an objective uh, covering cash flow effects that I've already mentioned was really important to users. Um, I won't talk about every single one of these. Uh, what I will do is just highlight a couple of other examples to bring out some of the, uh, the aspects and benefits of the board's proposals. So another item you can see on the slide is an objective about the nature of and risks associated with defined benefit plans. Uh, now, we haven't included all of the detailed proposals on this slide, but all of these objectives are followed by explanations of what users will do with any information provided and items of information to help an entity satisfy the objective. So, in other words, the proposals give a lot of tools to help companies determine what is material in their case, thus helping them to eliminate irrelevant detail and focus on what is important. A narrative information about the nature of and risks associated with defined benefit plans is a great example of where those kinds of benefits of the proposals could be realised. Uh, the other example um, I will pick out now um, is the specific disclosure objective on measurement uncertainty. Uh, once again, what this does is really focus on the underlying user information need and explain it in the standard. What you typically see disclosed today is a detailed assumption by assumption sensitivity analysis. However, users have told us that those individual assumption sensitivities often do not reflect realistic scenarios. 
What they want is an overall understanding of the potential uncertainty and risk associated with the determination of the defined benefit obligation and the ability to assess for themselves if a company has used reasonable assumptions. So the feedback we've received demonstrates that there may be a simpler way to satisfy the underlying user need that may be less costly for companies. Um, so again, this provides another example of how the proposed approach could help companies to move away from that checklist mentality and focus their disclosures only on the information that is effective in meeting user needs in their case. Um, so, so I will well, stop there, very happy to, to answer questions on, on any of the other objectives should, should they come up, um, but I will we'll hand over to the next speaker. Yes, Katrin. Yeah, um, on the next slide you can see the EFRAC um, positions. So EFRAC has considered the application of the proposed approach to IRS 19. Um, EFRAC considered that it is um, not in the position to express defined, uh, to express the view on the proposed changes um, and their expected effects until EFRAC um, has conducted appropriate outreach and field testing. So field testing is, is essential for that project. Um, regarding IRS 19, our understanding is the standard was identified as contributing to lengthy disclosures in some cases, whereas the informative value of the disclosures was generally uh, considered adequate. Therefore, providing evidence uh, of the improvements in the information value is really key for that project. In its draft comment letter, um, EFRAC generally agrees that the overall disclosure objective for defined benefit plans in the exposure draft could be useful for preparers. Um, clear objectives will uh, help entities to understand the overall information needs of the users of financial statements. However, behavior is an aspect here. EFRAC notes that the extent of the effects of the changes will depend also on the behavior of the preparers and their appetite for a reduction of the information provided. The proposed specific disclosure objectives for defined benefit plans capture the correct aspects from EFRAC point of view, um, the aspects that are needed by the users. However, with respect to the specific disclosure objectives relating to nature and risk associated with defined benefit plans, EFRAC observed that the exposure draft refers broadly um, to the nature of the benefits or the risks without defining the term. Um, EFRAC is concerned that if not tailored more specifically, the exposure draft may not improve substantially than lengthy narrative information about defined benefit plans. Part of the inquiries are related to the proposed changes in relation to the sensitivity analysis. Um, so the current required sensitivity analysis shall be replaced with a broader objective that requires uh, information that enables uh, users of financial statements to understand the significant actual assumptions used. While the sensitivity analysis is costly, it is, uh, from a FRAC point of view, useful um, to users, and therefore FRAC considered that this um, information should be mandatory. Um, benefits and costs are inquired during outreach activities and uh, especially addressed during the field test. So um, that is really an aspect that uh, will um, we are highly interested to give feedback to the ISB. more common. 
Therefore, it might be advisable to develop specific disclosure requirements for defined contribution plans. And um, that would prevent as well that um, incomplete disclosures are provided um, related to such type of plans. In relation to um, other employee benefits and, and multi-employer plans, I think agrees uh, with the proposals given in the um, um, exposure draft. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrin. And then we hand it over to our panelists. Uh, for the panelists on the IS-19 amendments, we welcome back Nicholas, Malgozata and Dennis from the previous panel. And we also welcome two new panelists. That will be Anna vidal Tuno. I hope I pronounce it correct. Anna is the Accounting Policies and Financial Regulations Director at Kaizef Bank Group. And uh, she is uh, uh, also a member of EFRAC's Financial Instruments Working Group. Um, also, we welcome André Geidenkoten, who is a principal at Aon Hewitt in Germany and is a qualified and enrolled actuary and is focusing on the pension plan design, valuation and accounting and is uh, also uh, a member of the ARBA, the German Association for Occupational Pensions. Let's just kick off since we're a bit of behind time. Um, first question goes to Anna and Niklas. Um, what are your thoughts on the way the proposed approach of the ISB has been implemented for IS9? And I would suppose we start with Anna, if that's all right. Thank you, Michael. Um, on my view, the outcome of applying this new ISB guidance to IS-19, and in particular for defined benefit plans, it will provide a good basis for preparers to focus on relevant information about the characteristics of the benefits we provide to employees, but also on the risks that we are exposed to. At the same time, I believe that uh, it will allow preparers to move away from this prescriptive approach, the checklist, um, that we were mentioning before, and that usually this approach does not provide complete and useful information to the users of, of financial reporting. And also, year after year, is making financial statements longer than, than necessary. Some, sometimes um, you read the disclosures on employee benefits, and it's really uh, very difficult to arrive to an overall composition of what are the main benefits, uh, which are the, the main risks for the company. So. Um, we believe that uh, this new IS ISB guidance, it will provide a, a good basis. If we compare the current disclosures uh, requirements in IS-19 with the new proposed approach, I would like to highlight some, some positive points. The first is that many compulsory disclosures will become only applicable if they are relevant and material to meet the specific disclosure objectives. And although there will still be some mandatory disclosures that will allow for certain comparative information, we believe that the ISB is providing a basis to articulate the judgment that uh, we need to comply with these disclosure objectives. Second, uh, the second point, uh, the ISB has added new pieces of information that uh, we believe it, they will be useful for users, such as the, the strategies that the entity has in place to manage the defined benefit plans and also the identified risks, and whether also these plans are open or closed to new members. Uh, from our side, uh, it's important to note that some companies were already disclosing, disclosing these aspects, but making them explicit in the standard, we believe it's going to be um, easier to exercise the, the judgment. Sherry? Sorry. Um, and a third observation is that the new proposals are required to disclose information that will allow users to understand the significant actuarial assumptions that the company is using instead of focusing on those assumptions themselves. Um, by this point, I mean that um, it's not important whether a company is using a, a specific a standard mortality table to estimate the, the obligations, but the reasons, the reasons why it's using uh, this table, which other uh, alternatives they have considered, and the effects that uh, this has had in the financial position and the performance of, of, of that company. However, um, and we have heard uh, in the previous panel, there are some other aspects that may need a deeper thought to assess the benefits of the ISB proposals. And in this case, we totally agree that the fieldwork is necessary. And 
once it is being conducted, we will have uh, more insights and we can provide a more uh, specific view on, on these other points. Uh, to mention some of them, um, how the information on cash flows and the sensitivity analysis is currently used by users, and all this to assess the effectiveness of the, of the new proposals. Just as a... Um, as an overall overview, uh, as a financial institution with, uh, with uh, some uh, background and uh, we have uh, a large experience in, in Spain and in Portugal, um, we have uh, a mix of defined contribution schemes with uh, also defined benefit plans. We have some legacy uh, plans that come from previous uh, mergers and business combinations. Each of these plans has different uh, materialities and different features and characteristics that, that lead uh, to different risk exposures. So um, we believe that the new approach uh, will improve the current information. Uh, it will make sure that the information we provide as a whole is useful. And we also believe that uh, it will provide us with more flexibility on which are the more relevant disclosures and which are the, rest, the less irrelevant ones as we support the reduction of detailed disclosure checklists. So um, as a challenge, um, all the preparers, we will need to use more appropriate judgment, document uh, how we have achieved uh, certain conclusions and also why the information we, we propose to provide you know, in this case is useful for, for users. Um, looking forward, we face some challenges, but it's also an opportunity to improve our financial statements. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, improving the financial statements is always a good reason. I think we're all after that. Thank you very much. And uh, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, just in general, I believe that the proposed disclosure requirements are useful, but, but you have that kind of caveat with, with regards to what I said of looking into what the users may need and so on. But if you just focus on what's written in the ED for IS-19, I think in general it's useful. Uh, having implemented IS-19 in 2004 in Sweden, what I see noticed then being present in 29 countries is that different plans are different in different parts of the world. And when I read the proposal, uh, I think it focuses a lot on UK pension trusts. So, so, so the disclosure requirements that are written there is really relevant for our UK pension trust, but not necessarily as relevant for, for instance, for, for our Swedish pension trust. So, 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 so I, I think that's a pity that, that the kind of the, the shell requirements are focusing a little bit too much on UK pension trusts and not capturing that it may be other structures and other risks and other plans. That said, it's written in the end of the standard that if it's not relevant, display other information. So it works, but, but I would have appreciated if it, the, the kind of basic requirements were more balanced, capturing the different features of different plans globally. Uh, with regards to sensitivity analysis, uh, uh, I think it's a pity that they have been taken away with regards to the discount rate. The, all assumptions regarding a defined benefit are kind of long-term assessments, but not the discount rate. The discount rate is the current rate, and it affects your balance sheet and your equity directly. So, so that should be kind of one point estimate that, that you always display the sensitivity in. Else, I think if really disregarding costs, a scenario-based sensitivity analysis where you change several different parameters at the same time would be useful for the users. That's something uh, we prepare when I previously was head of group capital management to, to kind of manage the future capital situation. So, so that's useful information, but perhaps too much to require. Uh, and finally, to save some time, I'm a little bit disappointed that it was not added more with regards to the defined contribution plans. If you look at the single year, it's just an expense. But if you look at some some of the plans, it really could be both volatile cash flows and volatile earnings. If you kind of repeat that defined contribution promise for a single employee during his life employment with an employer. So, so I think it was a pity that you haven't captured that risk that's quite similar to defined benefit, I would say. I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas.
Margazanta, do you have a brief view also to provide? I try. Uh, <laughs> well, first, uh, my impression is that the proposals indeed clearly discourage checklist mentality by the way they are structured, by using specific language. So this, for me, it works. But overall, appreciating what, what Anna said, I think still that there is a risk that many preparers will simply continue to, to provide the same disclosures as under current IS-19, because they may argue that, that they already meet the disclosure objectives well. Or they can simply eliminate information which are marked as non-mandatory disclosures in the proposed standards. So, so again, enforceability becomes an issue. At the same time, when I look at the proposals, I am thinking that they can be interpreted in a very different ways by different preparers and enforcers. So it would be very helpful to, to perform extensive field testing. I'm very interested uh, what will be the outcome to, uh, of the field testing and, and also to add guidance to the standard on making materiality judgment and assessing whether the objectives uh, are met or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margot uh, Let's move to André. André, uh, if I may, um, you're being one of the people who practically prepare the information that is used in financial statements by companies. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, thank you. Happy to share some thoughts on that. But first, um, um, uh, briefly coming back to what, what, what Niklas said um, also, want to underpin that that reading the exposure draft I also have the feeling that sometimes um, it is written in a kind of um, from from an anglo-saxon uh, view and um, sometimes um, um, misses the opportunity to also take into consideration other plan types across the globe that have a, a different framework they operate in um, yeah, on on the on the prepare prepare uh, prepare preparation uh, view. So uh, to prepare those informations, uh, the window to provide the information uh, is 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 typically a, a very narrow one. And for all people, uh, all parties involved, preparers, auditors, um, actuaries, uh, a very busy time of the year. So. It is very important to 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 carefully plan ahead, to to early in the year plan what is what is needed um, to know to know exactly uh, what uh, should be prepared, uh, and uh, to avoid uh, lengthy processes or discussions or duplicate work in that um, uh, busy uh, period of the year um, where where. Uh, let's say basically all needs to function um, um, in a very smooth and efficient way. Um, and, and otherwise that would definitely translate into to, um, inefficiencies and uh, ultimately also uh, unnecessary cost. Um, and also it's very important to, um, yeah, to define a process with the auditors um, um, to agree on um, how to apply the judgment, how to apply materiality guidance, and um, uh, to finally come to, uh, to the decision what information needs to be collected. Um, yeah, um, I, I think basically cash flow requirements or cash flow information is a very, very important topic. Um, um, but regarding cash flows, it's also important to to, to decide what what has to be presented, is it the crude cash flow so that what is reflected uh, on the balance sheet in the DBO, or is it the full cash flows, the full future cash flows, including further uh, accrual? Is it the benefit payments out of the uh, obligation? Is it uh, contributions into the plan? So considering whether it's an unfunded plan, a partly funded plan, a funded plan. Um, that is, uh, I think, important and where further uh, guidance may be helpful. Otherwise, um, uh, um, things that need to be disclosed, uh, need to be um, discussed with the auditors um, and, and in, in the way of judgment. Uh, assumption setting that was mentioned already also by, by Niklas, the 
discount rate that is a particular important uh, information and a and 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 a large leverage for for the for the um, for the obligation. Uh, so more um, more narrow guidance um, uh, could be helpful there, and the sensitivity disclosures is definitely an important uh, uh, important thing on that. Very helpful for users and for preparers, auditors as well as we we hear from from our clients definitely. So basically, um, to 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 uh, the last statement, we hear from clients that the quantitative IS nineteen disclosures are viewed as 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 uh, as helpful from from many. So the need to prepare different information I see um, um, at, at least in some instances as limited. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre. And you just mentioned that the sensitivity analysis may no longer be mandatory. Dennis, what would be your view on the well uh, missing sensitivity analysis? Okay, thanks, Michael. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, that's a promise, not a threat. Um, first of all, I think the 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 pension disclosure illustrates the dilemma for uh, the ISP because for users. Uh, for a handful of companies, disclosure on defined benefit pension schemes is crucial. We, we want everything there is to know if you are looking at companies that have significant legacy DB schemes. Uh, where, where, the, where the issue is not material, we're happy to have a more summarized version. So uh, we always thought why, why in this particular area, the concept of materiality is not stronger applied. Now, second observation is, now, why do we need the pension information now, apart from the, the, let's say, the income statement information on your EBIT, your EBITDA, and your cash flows? What we're interested in is the, 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 the deficit on the funded DB scheme or the liability for an unfunded DB, for an unfunded DB scheme, because that's a claim on the value of the business. Uh, after tax, of course, but that's an important element of the valuation of a company. Clearly, the pension liability, as Nicholas said, is enormously sensitive to change in the discount rate. So that is a crucial disclosure that we would like to have. Now, I'm, I'm probably less concerned about mortality and career progression, although I'm interested in Catherine's suggestion on how that might work from a standard setters perspective. But uh, the discount rate information is, I think, absolutely uh, crucial. Now, finally, uh, on Andre's point, um, is also needed, I think, to have a balance between the narrative and the numbers, because the numbers are what is commonly appreciated. And perhaps the narrative uh, might not be as relevant from a user perspective as, as are the numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Andre, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, agree with Dennis uh, on, on the narrative. So I also heard that from from many uh, clients that um, there's a lot of lengthy um, narrative that 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 may not so it may not so be important. Um, just one comment um, uh, I, I want to make um, on 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 the notion of um, to provide um, information on measurement uncertainty um, by by. Um, a range of, of possible other uh, valuations. I think that's that's um, um, a difficult concept and maybe also um, 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 counterproductive for for the the basic concept of best estimate. So requiring from a company to provide a best estimate uh, view on their pensions and then uh, two or three alter, uh, alternative best estimate. Uh, possible best estimate views on pensions. I think that's um, um, difficult and could could um, um, lead to, to 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 discussions that that companies and and we all don't want to have. But I think sensitivity analysis um, to focus on on important things and combined with cash flow analysis, um, I think that that could uh, still be very helpful uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andre.
Um, so let's have a quick look in between to the polling questions that we have put to the audience. Uh, we asked the audience uh, whether uh, they agree with the ISB that the cost of providing the current sensitivity analysis would outweigh the benefits and there would be less costly way to fulfill the underlying investor needs. And 50% said, yes, there are the new specific disclosure objectives will provide users with a reasonable idea of the range of possible values for the defined benefit obligations. And then we have basically equal answers to the other three options. I'll skip that in the name of time. And then we asked also the audience, do you consider the information about future cash flows of defined benefit obligations is more important to investors than detailed sensitivity analysis? analysis? Um, 58% or 59% said yes, this forms the basis of the calculation and therefore this is important information and allows analysts to do their own sensitivity analysis as preferred. And 35% uh, says the timing of the cash flows and sensitivity information are both of equal value of information. Thank you for that. Right, we'll move on uh, to the next question. Uh, I'll put that to, to Nicholas, Anna and Dennis. Um, uh, there has been quite some discussions at EFRAC around the requirements for cash flows of the defined benefit obligations and disclosures around hybrid plans. Uh, Nicholas, first question to you. Do you have any thoughts on either or both of the topics? Yes, with regards to, to cash flows, as I mentioned before, different plans are very different. If you look at one extreme, it's uh, our Swedish pension system, for instance. If you look at material cash flows, we put in cash flows in the beginning of the 50s, and thereafter the returns have been such high that we have financed all our future uh, earned defined benefit schemes. So, and so it really haven't been any kind of net cash flows since the 50s in that. So, so, so there I don't consider it, it's the cash flows that's of interest. It's the interest of if the, what's the kind of the, the, the break even point, what kind of level of earnings or, or return are needed in assets to continue to finance those defined benefit schemes. That's the sensitivity that need to be a focus of, on and not the actual cash flows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicholas, uh, sorry, yes, Nicholas. Um, Anna, what, do you have anything to add? Not a lot. Uh, I completely agree with Nicholas. Nicholas' previous comments, uh, in particular for the banking industry, it's really important uh, sensitivity analysis, how the changes in the discount rate uh, impact the net, net interest margin, the, the actuarial gains and losses, and our own funds. So uh, I, will keep, I will keep it here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was very brief. Don't want to rush you, by the way. Uh, we don't want to leave any valuable comment out. Um, moving again to Dennis, anything you want to add from your perspective to that question? Well, not not necessarily. Perhaps on the cash flows from the uh, from the scheme to the pensioners, uh, but ultimately interested in the the required cash flows from the sponsor to the plan. Uh, and clearly, that's a moving target because that will be impacted by how uh, the deficit or the liability moves. So, uh, any information, guidance on uh, future cash flows from the sponsor to the scheme, I think, are well appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Then I'll move to Malgozata. Uh, on defined benefit plans, there are quite a lot of items that are mandatory. Uh, do you think these strike the correct balance for the ISB's approach, or would you have made any changes? Well, indeed, there is a lot of mandatory disclosures, uh, which I think simply reflects the complexity associated with defined benefit plans. And I would even add some points to the list, like sensitivity analysis, uh, inputs to discount rate. This was all mentioned by Dennis and, and Andre. This is also in our draft comment letter. Anyway, the question was about the balance between mandatory and non-mandatory disclosures. And on that, I personally share the concerns around differentiating at all between mandatory and non-mandatory disclosures. Because, uh, well, 
some non-mandatory disclosures may well become mandatory disclosing a specific information meets a specific disclosure objective. And the other way around, mandatory disclosures don't have to be disclosed if the information is assessed to be useless or immaterial for users. And if so, they sort of become non-mandatory. So I think that splitting the requirements between mandatory and non-mandatory can be potentially confusing. And we have already some non-mandatory disclosures in IFRSs, for example, in IS 36 on impairment of assets. And from my experience, it's, it's very difficult to enforce them. For this particular exposure draft, the language used is, is very important, and, and I would suggest to consider amending those phrases and not making this differentiation. And one last point I wanted to make is that, well, again, I think it's very difficult uh, to make the judgment required by the standard which information do meet specific disclosure objectives and which do not. And I think some guidance would be very helpful, some additional guidance. And when I was looking at proposed illustrative examples, I was thinking that it would be helpful if they show not only the final disclosure, the outcome, which is supposed to be included in the financial statements, but also that they can illustrate and discuss the process, the thinking which led to disclosing certain information and not disclosing another information. So what could be added to the illustrative examples is, for example, a kind of mapping of standard requirements to what was ultimately disclosed with some explanations, but reality considerations maybe, some judgments and justifications for the judgments. I understand that this is tough and there is a risk of misinterpretation, but this can be something which really may add value and, and may make the whole proposals complete and, and sort of comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Margus Um All right, then we are basically through with our second panel. Thanks to all the panelists. And we have two questions from the audience. One I would put to Catherine. Uh, the question is, how should a user be able to move away from the existing disclosure requirements to better disclosures about cash flow risks, as mentioned? Uh, without specific disclosure requirements developed by the ISB? Um, yes, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, with regard to the, the, the requirement to um, provide information that enables users to, to understand those cash flow effects. Um, I'm going to start by coming back to something Francois mentioned earlier, which is that the, um, the, the proposals give a huge amount of support to companies in applying judgment. And in actual fact, uh, this objective across every single thing that is proposed in the exposure draft, um, the board has given more guidance on this one than any other. Um, there are explanations of what users will do with the information, items of information, there's application guidance, there's illustrative examples, all with the aim of giving companies tools to apply judgment and disclose what's relevant. Um, and I would add to that that it is in my view, really beneficial that that is the, the approach the board took here. So it's already been raised by a couple of panel members, um, the fact that defined benefit pension schemes vary. They vary between companies, they vary between jurisdictions. So for example, um, a company with um, a net deficit that has an agreed deficit reduction plan in place, what is useful information that would meet user needs on cash flow effects there is likely to be very different than for a company that, say, doesn't have um, such a plan in place. Uh, equally, there are some companies that, when mo monitoring those cash flow expectations internally, uh, might look at it from a holistic perspective, doing funding calculations that amalgamate future payments for services with the, those sort of deficit reduction plans and there are others that would separate the two things and actually with this objective we had long discussions with companies and users together to interrogate what would meet needs here and what we learned from companies was that they agree that this is important valuable information and in fact it is often monitored internally today and what users say is that well you know if the information is useful to those 
managing the scheme and planning how to deal with, with deficits and such, then that information that's useful for that purpose is likely to be useful to, for us too. And as I said, that, that varies. So what the proposals do is give um, explanations and guidance for these different scenarios that can exist and things that might be relevant in those different um, scenarios, hence the, the various examples. Um, and really what it allows is for companies to disclose the information that meets the need best in their circumstances because in response to the question if the board were to um, mandate specific disclosure requirements for particular pieces of information that might be great for some companies coming back to Nicholas's point it might be great for certain UK schemes but it might not work for, for those Swedish schemes so affording that judgment and giving the companies support to do it um, we think would enable again in answer to the question companies to move away from what they're doing today and disclose that that more useful information. So I will, I will stop there. Sorry, long answer to to a great question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, one more question uh, that will ask Dennis: uh, the discount round, discount rate sensitivity has an impact on equity, but not on expected future cash flows. So it might be more valuation issue than liquidity issue. What are your thoughts, Dennis? Uh, thank you. Well, clearly. There is a valuation issue if you believe that the value of a company's equity is a function of the value of the business, what we call the enterprise value, and then deducting, in this case, the, the deficit on the defined benefit scheme or the liability. Uh, so, yes, there is, a, there is a valuation angle. But clearly, uh, if there are changes to the liability on the back of change to discount rates and that works against the company, then that will lead to future cash flows going from the sponsor to the scheme. Uh, so in that sense, it will also be going forward a liquidity issue. So I think it's difficult to kind of disentangle the two. They have a valuation and a liquidity and capital structure component, uh, in my view. All right. Thanks, Dennis. All right. Then we'll round off our panel to the IS-19 amendments. And we'll thank you for all the panelists, um, and we'll have a completely new set of panelists uh, for the amendments on IFRS 13. But Catherine Donkersley will stay with us to present the ISB proposal, and then we'll have Frédéric uh, from EFRAC to explain uh, our draft comment letter and our EFRAC's views. And I'm sure I don't need to say much about you, Frédéric. You joined EFRAC in 2017, and you work on many projects, including uh, also the corporate, uh, corporate sustainability reporting side now. Uh, so welcome back, and welcome, Frédéric. And uh, Catherine, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again. Um, so on IFRS 13, um, comparing this to employee benefits, what we heard here was really quite different and will test the application of that guidance for the board in a very different way. Uh, so I've, if I were to summarise uh, what we've heard on IFRS 13 in one sentence, I'd say that it is all about materiality. Specifically, users tell us they get pages of information about immaterial fair value measurements and sometimes little information about those fair value measurements that they regard as significant. At the same time, companies say that detailed information is onerous to prepare and that users rarely ask questions about it. In summary, then, what we've heard is not that the technical content of fair value measurement disclosures is the wrong content. It's more that the information is not always provided about the most useful population of items. So you could say a measure of success here would be the board developing a set of disclosure requirements that helps companies to focus their information on those fair value measurements that users are really interested in. And the board's proposals are intended to do that in a few ways. Uh, firstly, and moving on to the next slide, uh, the board proposes to do that by developing disclosure objectives that, as we've discussed, explain investor needs in detail. 
Across everything we've heard, a key message that came through was about understanding a company's exposure to uncertainty. So exactly what fair value measurements does a company have and what are the uncertainties surrounding those measurements? And the board has proposed an overall disclosure objective along those lines and then reflected that theme of uncertainty across all of the specific objectives that follow. So on this slide, you can see the user information needs underlying each of those objectives. And again, they're described in detail in the proposals. Similar to what I explained on IAS 19, each of these objectives is supplemented with various tools to help a company apply judgment and determine what needs to be disclosed to meet that required objective. Uh, the second way the proposals respond to the feedback we've had is by requiring companies to focus on the appropriate level of detail and ensure that relevant information is not obscured by insignificant detail. This is intended to reinforce the materiality requirements in IAS 1 and give companies additional confidence about applying judgment, eliminating the immaterial and focusing their disclosures on the fair value measurements that are material. Thirdly, the proposals avoid referring to levels of the fair value hierarchy where that is possible and helpful, um, and that is to remove any perception that detailed disclosures should be provided for fair value measurements in particular levels, regardless of materiality. Investors have described the levels of the hierarchy as representing a continuum of measurement uncertainty rather than three distinct buckets. So the best example of that idea is that some level two items will be close to level one, while some will be close to level three and therefore contain more uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, Understanding exposure to uncertainty is key for investors and is clearly captured in the proposed disclosure objectives. So applying them, if a company has material assets in level two of the fair value hierarchy, understanding things like the extent to which those items are towards the level three end of the scale is something investors care about and something that would be relevant to satisfying that first objective you can see on the slide. So what's important is for companies to disclose relevant information for material fair value measurements, again, coming back to that project theme of giving companies what they need to focus disclosure on the information that really matters. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and hand over to the next speaker. And that will be Frédéric. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Almu. So, uh, good day, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the overall approach, uh, but I do want to say something about the alternative uh, fair values um, uh, regarding uh, level three specifically, but also the other uh, levels in the uh, fair value disclosures. So currently we have sensitivity disclosures and in previous work that EFRAC did, we did find that users considered that to be uh, useful information. When we talk to preparers, they have some, and valuers, they have some concerns about what does it mean when you have this range of alternative fair values. Now I think for the technocrats amongst us, we are very comfortable with the idea that there is a range of fair values and that you pick a value from that. But it was very interesting to me that especially when you talk to people that value uh, non-financial instruments, they're quite hesitant about that idea and what that might mean to users of uh, financial statements. So we are also very concerned, and, and I have to say this is something I pushed, and, and Catherine, I'm sorry, I'm going to now focus on level two specifically. Having worked at a bank and having been responsible for these type of disclosures, I can tell you that the level two items are generally to the order of something like definitely 10 to 15 times even more bigger than the level three items. And yes, then you have to ascertain how much of that uh, 
can have alternative values. And this can be a variety of situation, even with something like interest rate derivatives. If you have a really long term for your interest rate derivative, the end of that curve may be extra extrapolated and others might have different views on that. But more importantly, for these kind of interest rate derivatives that might be pretty vanilla, is the calculation of the credit valuation adjustment, either for your own credit or for the counterparty's credit, where I don't think we've We've had some convergence in how people approach it, but they are still very different ways of approaching that outside. So for me, the concern is, uh, would the alternative fair values be useful? How do we explain that to people, that they don't lose confidence in the number that is actually in the financial statements? And then also, as I said, the burden that this could uh, leave on the preparers. Uh, I want to say where I referred there to mandatory items, sorry, uh, Catherine, undermining your, well, at least I didn't say minimum disclosures, but yes, the items around the fair value hierarchy, the reconciliation of the level three, we agree with all those. And then um, we are concerned that the level of judgment should not be so high that it impairs relevance. That is it from my side, Michael, I hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Friedrich. And then we'll move it right to the panel. And let me welcome to our panel on the IFRS 13 amendments, uh, Selma Marte. Selma is the head of group accounting policies at BNB Paribas and also a member of FRAC's financial instruments working groups. Uh, we have Sylvie Kops. Sylvie works for KP in the UK and is there a technical expert on IFRS and local gap and provides support within KPMG and is also part of KPMG's financial instruments topics team. And she's uh, also a member of uh, what I guess is the Netherlands Institute of Chartered Accountants, if that's correct. Then we welcome Raoul Vogel. He's a member of the Austrian Financial Reporting Enforcement Panel. He's a member of the Financial Instruments Working Groups, also of the Austrian Standard Center, AFRAC. And um, then we also have, uh, as the fourth participant on our panel, Peter Malmquist, who is an, uh, Peter is an independent equity analyst, a member of the board of the accounting surveillance in Sweden, and a visiting professor in the financial accounting and company valuation at the Stockholm School of Economics and part of EFRAC's user panel. So let's kick it off. Uh, with Selma, can you tell us your thoughts on how the general approach with respect to how disclosures have been done in the pr in practice for IFRS 13 and what this means on a more practical basis? Hello, thank you. So, I'm supportive of a general approach for disclosures based on clearly identified overall and specific objectives. This is a necessary step to produce disclosures that meet IS1 requirement to provide the relevant information that enables users to understand the impact of significant transaction on the entity's financial statements. So now, if we look more precisely at IFRS 13 overall and specific objectives, as proposed in the exposure draft, I would say that the overall objective, which is to evaluate the entity's exposure to uncertainty from fair value measurement, is a reasonable target for disclosures on fair value measurement. As regards specific objectives for assets and liabilities measured at fair value, these are quite comprehensive and, as, as was mentioned earlier, apply regardless of the classification in the fair value hierarchy. So even if I personally share these objectives from a, a theoretical uh, perspective, from a bank standpoint, these uh, disclosure raise concerns about how to make them work given the huge volume of assets and liabilities. So if level three disclosure relate to a small number of assets and liabilities, uh, there are huge volumes of instruments in level one and level two, as mentioned by Frédéric. Therefore, tracking, for instance, the reason for changes in fair value or the reasons for transfer between uh, level one and level two uh, might be extremely complex to achieve, even if we only focus on those which are material. Uh, 
Another concern is about the disclosure of information that may be commercially sensitive if the level of granularity is, is, is quite high. My last comment will be about the objective set for asset and liabilities not measured at fair value. I have to admit that I struggle to understand the usefulness of such information. If we take the example of a portfolio of loans in the hold to collect business model measured at amortized cost, so expected to be held until maturity, and for which we already have a proxy of revaluation in respect of credit risk through IFRS 9 impairment, what would be the usefulness for users to have a fair value measurement if such fair value never materializes or only in exceptional situations? Such information is very difficult and costly to obtain and loans are not monitored on uh, and loans which are not monitored on a fair value basis are in systems which do not have the, the information. So consequently, um, if the computation of fair value is made only for disclosure purposes, it is difficult to avoid a high level of uncertainty in the, the measurement of this fair value, which again reduces the usefulness of the information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selma. Very insightful. Uh, let's move it to the user perspective and to Peter. Um, I believe you have brought a slide to show to us, if that's correct. Then, Almo, can we please see it? Yes, thank you. It's yes. already up. So, Peter, you're going to tell us on how the information of fair value is used by users for corporates. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, what I've tried to put together is a slide that trying to describe <clears throat> in which areas or if you like standards IFRS 13 shows up and uh, to me it's very much about the problems having level three valuations because the level one or two is mainly within IFRS 9 and financial instruments and I'm quite sure that I have not really understand all the level two valuations in financial instruments that I've come across, but normally that is not a problem. And level one is definitely not a problem. And to me, level two is very much about derivatives. And as was said previously, there might be very long derivatives that I haven't really noticed. But to me, level one and level two is not such a big problem, really. Uh, it is when we come to level three, uh, we end up in problems, calculations, DCF multiple, uh, DCF models, or if you like, uh, multiples of, of different sorts. And as you can see, and uh, as I have tried to explain in this slide, the mid column means that the problem, the accounting problem, uh, does not affect the calculation of the enterprise value, as Dennis Yellen mentioned previously. The enterprise value is calculated by the help of the ongoing flow, cash flow or earnings or whatever you like. If it affects that part of the valuation, it's very serious. If it affects the balance sheet, more or less, it is we are trying to compile, put together the net debt to market value. And we put that in, if it's a debt, then we deduct it from the enterprise value. And if it is, of, for some reason, a positive item, it will add to the value. I mean, if we do market valuations, regardless almost which uh, area you are in, if it goes up 10% or down 10% and it affects the net debt, the impact on the valuation is not that severe. It is if it uh, impacts the cash flow, the perception at least of cash flow and earnings that it is severe. And as I have tried to include here, normally the fair valuations are important from this net debt perspective. Then of course, I can have uh, property in a property company using IS40. And my view is that investors are very closely following that value and are trying to value property companies according to that value. Then if I dig into the level three valuation that they have, that is normally a mix of a discounted cash flow model and a kind of a multiple that they assess. What I'm, of course, is always when I have a level three valuation interested in, 
because normally that is a discounted cash flow model. Also, when you do an impairment test, is uh, of course the cost of capital, and that I normally uh, get from the footnotes in the annual report. But of course, I'm also interested in the cash flow or earnings, if you like, the final year of the estimation period. And that, of course, I will never get, because that means that if the company will give me that number and they will calculate the, the growth rate that they have estimated, they will also give to me sensitive, extremely sensitive information about the view of the total company. So that kind of information I will never get. And consequently, uh, the usefulness of a level three valuation uh, using a DCF model, even if you com com put it together with a multiple, is, of course, not that great. Now, here's the key question then. Do I want the property companies to put the numbers together without any kind of evaluation of the property? And if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I said, yes, definitely. Let me look at the income statement instead and look at the cash flow in the companies. But today, given I think at least that the valuations are backed by external parties like valuers coming into the picture, I think, no, I, I think I, given although I have this uncertainty, valuation uncertainty uh, in that very sensitive and important area, I think I would stick to the fair valuations. And what I would like to have is, of course, uh, an estimate of the future growth in the company and what that means for the final, very often in, in, in uh, property valuations, 10th year. Now, you can go through all these different kind of standards, and I can say the last one, the IS-16 and IS-38, I have hardly ever come across. So I wouldn't look upon that as a problem when you do revaluation of, of uh, uh, fixed assets or intangible assets. So hadn't it been for, for this crazy car company buying a lot of bitcoins, I would not have even uh, noticed that it was possible to do revaluations according to IS-38 either, because I have never, previous to that, I've never come across that previously. So the information that I would like to require is on the level three side, and the information I would like to have is the most sensitive one. What kind of growth rate do you use when you estimate the coming cash flows up until this fifth or tenth year? But unfortunately, that is so sensitive, so I will never, uh, <laughs> the ISP will never be able to put that into a standard. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, for some information that you actually can have, a uh, question would be, would you prefer the current sensitivity analysis for IFRS, uh, for uh, level three items, or would you prefer the proposed alternative fair value measurements? No, yeah. I, I, I would prefer to stick to the current situation. I think this is very difficult whatever kind of requirement you put on the companies, there will always be some asset or some liability, particularly when you dig into the financial sector, that doesn't really fit into the present structure. That will always happen. To leave it up to the company to decide which information that I can use, I think it's the wrong way to go. Uh, the ISP standards had taught me a lot as an analyst, about what kind of information I would put to the company. And I have received that from the standards. So I, I'm flattered that you are always interested in what I think as an analyst. And, I, and again, going back to Dennis Yellen, he, he mentioned that there are several types of analysts, and I'm an equity sell side analyst to, to underline that. But that asking me what kind of information I would like to have when I, when I dig into a standard, when I dig into footnotes, I can see a lot of information uh, that I really thought was possible to get from the company. I think the present way to, to go forward is the best, that the ISP is putting down a checklist for the companies to, to fulfill. Uh, sorry, it's against all the others, but I'm very pleased with the present situation, I must say. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And all that information must be audited. Let me move to Sylvie. Sylvie, what are the disclosures that you think may become challenging and will be subject to more discussions under the proposals that are on the table at the moment? 
Thanks, Michael. Um, well, I think it's a real good question. And um, when I started thinking about it, I thought about three points and they all link back to judgment. And that's also my first point. I think the big, big challenge here is going to be judgment. And I did like what Catherine said about it's all about materiality. But I think where preparers might be helped is if it would be more clear how to distinguish between judgment as to whether a particular disclosure is material, and that would apply both to mandatory and non-mandatory disclosures, and judgments that you make as to whether a particular non-mandatory disclosure meets the disclosure objective. Um, another point where, where I think there could be a challenge is that um, I've heard it's all about level three because that's where the measurement and uncertainty resides. So when looking through the ED, um, I think the, the, how it's currently proposed, the IFRS 13 requirements to disclose valuation techniques and significant unobservable inputs for level three value uh, measurements are currently in the category um, of non-mandatory. And as an auditor, that concerns me a bit. And that links into a point that Malgorzata made um, when she was talking about IS-19. My view would be, if you have level three, and if that is... Um, uh, quantitatively uh, material, then I would say uh, this will always be material and therefore I, I would have concerns about not making that mandatory and it may create problems with like, well, enforceability. Um, the second point that I did want to make, and again links into judgment and um, into the boundary be between level two and level three, because if we really think level three is the most important one, and that would be my personal view, then it would be really interesting to understand like, well, how how did an entity put the boundary between level their level two portfolios and their level three portfolios? Because if that's clear, then we can be comfortable at level two, we don't have to worry about that much because they have made, they had a sound judgment assessing they were indeed um, level two. And my, my last point is, is uh, I think, uh, is again about um, alternative um, fair values based on reasonably possible um, alternative um, scenarios, their challenges there would be the judgment because there is now a new judgment that is being brought upon us. Like, well, what is a reasonably possible alternative scenario that could have occurred at the year end? And I think people may have very different views um, on that. Um, I also think there are quite a lot of costs involved um, if this disclosure requirement would cover more than um, just level three uh, portfolios in actually producing them. Um, so um, I think that is a challenge and I'm not sure whether the cost of producing that outweighs the benefits of the current sensitivity analysis we have on level three that hopefully enables um, at the moment analysts to do their own analysis based on their views on what are reasonably possible alternative um, scenarios. Thanks, Michael. We'll come back to the cost in just a second. First, let me ask you, Raoul, whether you have something to add to what Sylvie said. Thank you, Michael. I share uh, Sylvie's uh, views, uh, in particular the one point that uh, she addressed a few times, and that is judgment. Um, if one looks at what uh, has happened over many years in various countries uh, with regard to enforcement processes, you uh, often find that uh, the assessments by enforcement panels and here on there, the error corrections that are then enforced are the application of judgment. So the more we have judgment playing a role in accounting and also in disclosures, the more likely it is that here and there, the contentious issues are going to be uh, coming up. The other point that I would also just like to raise, uh, and that is uh, something I just mentioned uh, by other panelists already, uh, not just uh, now under IFRS 13, but also in the beginning, and that is that uh, the new requirements could be quite onerous uh, for entities to comply with. Now, if you think about my background, um, I live in a relatively small country that companies tend to be smaller than perhaps in other larger territories.
increased uh, in Europe all around the world. And as a result, uh, one often finds that the infrastructure that entities require in order to comply with uh, very onerous requirements, be it uh, disclosure or be it accounting requirements, are difficult to comply with. And ultimately, what one then does is, I've done something. I've done the best that I possibly could. I'll go to my auditor now and see whether they will sign off on it. And uh, three months later, the accounts are in an enforcement process and the enforcer says, but I don't quite believe that uh, what you've done is adequate. And why is that happening? Because there is perhaps here and there not enough infrastructure, not enough uh, personnel available with suitable experience and thank you. Thank you very much, Raoul. I had a bit of trouble understanding you in between. I don't know whether that was just me. If somebody could me give, could give me a hint. But it seemed to be fine for everyone else, so that's good. So coming back oh, to it, our, it was it, uh, somewhat difficult. All right, all right. It was coming somewhat back. difficult to understand. All right. Uh, thank you very well, much. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to Raoul uh, in just a second. Let me just ask uh, Sylvie and Selma, and probably best starting with Selma, about the cost implications that we would have from the proposals on IFRS 13. Could you just give a brief idea, if you have one, uh, on, on how costly this would be? Okay. <clears throat> So <clears throat> the cost of providing disclosures that meet the exposure draft objectives will depend on the granularity of the information to be provided. And for entities like banks with huge volume of assets in level two, for instance, uh, providing uh, uh, detailed information as, for, in, as um, for example, in uh, example 19 on the alternative fair value me measurement, could be uh, indeed costly to, to provide. Also, the, the need to have more senior staff involved in the process will also have an impact on costs, even if we can rely on the established governance uh, for fair value measurement. And the difficulty will probably be to make senior management spend more time on these topics, identifying uh, the specific uh, in, uh, instrument or areas of uncertainty that will need to to give rise to, to to specific disclosures and also what type what type of disclosure to provide to to better reflect the the uncertainty uh, what is also difficult to assess today uh, is um, and that could have a, an impact on, on on the cost is how far these, uh, the, the judgment applied by management may be challenged by auditors or supervisors looking for more comparability between banks, um, as happened, for instance, uh, for um, cost of risk during the COVID-19 pandemic, and being obli obliged to add uh, an anticipated disclosure at quarter end would be costly and complex to achieve. So, you know, you know, in order to avoid such uncertainty, which is hardly compatible with closing constraints, it is not excluded that entities finally decide to provide all the disclosures in the DP, whether required, so whether mandatory or, or just suggested. And in that case, as for approaches based on checklist, judgment would be exercised to determine the appropriate level of disclosures to be provided. But as you see, there are different areas of concerns in terms of costs. Thank you very much, Selma. Sylvie, anything to add to that? Well, I agree with Selma that there are different ways of looking at the cost or the potential cost of the proposals. And I would not only when I would look at costs, obviously for me, benefits is the is the is linked to it in order to evaluate them. So my first comment would be like, well, IFRS 13, based on the PIR, um, I think generally um, the conclusion was that the disclosures were considered fit for purpose. So this is one comment that I would like to put out there. Um, and I think the other point that links in very much to what uh, Selma said is like, because there's so much more focus on judgment, 
as auditors, we will be told like, well, if we don't have any assessment of those judgments and if the, the bank or the, the audited entity would not have any documentation of their judgments, then they would consider it not being audited. So I think there will be a lot of documentation involved with um, making sure that those judgments are are um, are justifiable. And I think in that sense, I'm not entirely sure, and it comes then back to the behavioral angle, whether everybody is ready in order to do that. Or would, um, if we get an inspection, would a regulator then just say like, well, show me all those judgments. And my starting point would be the entire list of um, possible disclosures. So that's one of my um, concerns. Um, the other cost could indeed be less comparability because if disclosures keep changing over time, which may not be bad because if that's the relevant information that's needed, that um, may give a benefit. Um, because of uh, comparatives, one is not only changing it for this year, one would have to go back one year and also provide that information. So I think also in that sense, there might be more um, cost involved because of more judgments and more changes that will happen um, over time. All right. Thank you very much, Zoe. And we'll have two polling questions out, and then we'll come up with the last question that we will ask Raoul sort of to sum up. Uh, first question that we ask is, uh, do you think that providing alternative fair values is too burdensome for preparers when compared to the sensitivity analysis currently required for level three instruments? 80% said yes, if it is required for level two financial instruments as well. Otherwise, it would be the same level of work than currently required. So there, if, if we would only apply it to level three, then it would be fine, I take that. Second question was, do you consider that information about reasons for some changes in level one and two items apart from reclassification are useful to users? And there we have 75% saying, no, the information is not really useful, although it may be interesting. All right, and then we're close to the end of our third and last panel for today. I would give again the floor to Raoul. Uh, I at least had a bit of trouble understanding you, but maybe you want to sum up or add uh, to what has been discussed, just a couple of brief points from your perspective as an enforcer. Thank you, Michael. Um, I hope this is better now. I've, I've moved my microphone and uh, I've, I've turned up the volume on my microphone, so hopefully this is better now. Apologies, folks. Um, well, there are some major challenges uh, lying ahead for the various entities. Um, there are, there's a lot of information that's going to change if uh, the exposure graph does go through. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are challenges for smaller entities to try to comply with the uh, uh, new requirements. Uh, there will be a necessary change of mindset, and there will definitely be a culture change. This culture change will impact uh, the auditors. I think Sylvia alluded to that already. As an auditor, you're going to be faced with challenges, and for us as forces, we are effectively faced with exactly those same challenges. Ultimately, both an auditor and an enforcer are trying to ensure that there is trust in the capital market. And uh, with the new requirements, I believe that we are going to be facing with challenges regarding uh, culture and mindset changes. What uh, is maybe also important, uh, we heard it earlier on regarding digitalization, the use of uh, ESF, XBRL. Personally, I'm a big fan of digitalization. Um, I used to be an IT auditor, so I like playing with computers. Um, and I think uh, digitalization will be useful for both entities who need to comply with these new requirements, as well as uh, for Sorry, sorry, Raul. It may be again. It may be me, but I can only hear you very uh, with a like from a very bad connection. Okay. Last, last sentence. Then uh, I was on the verge of finishing. Um, I would just like to say that uh, for the entities, for auditors, and also for enforcers, the potential new electronic media such as ESF and XBRL are definitely going to be helpful. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. And then we'll round it off. Uh, thank you very much. We're a bit behind time. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank, thanks to EFRAC staff who prepared the meeting. Thanks to all who contributed to this. And I may hand it over now to Chiara, who has some takeaways for, for us. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to go through all uh, my notes, but uh, I think we got uh, very uh, valuable input, and I really thank all the participants. We have heard the support for the objective-based disclosure and the recognition that standard setting is needed uh, to change the current attitude and solve the disclosure problem. But we also have heard concerns uh, by preparing on the current language of this exposure draft. Uh, they would uh, uh, suggest to look at IFRS 7 as a good example of balanced language to uh, look at, but also we have heard a less positive message from uh, the enforcer's point of view, seeing that this is uh, still too risky, uh, is going too far. Uh, there is a support, therefore, to have some minimum requirements still needed. And also from the user's perspective, consider that users' need may change over time, having this minimum information was mentioned as a way to find whatever is essential to know when a certain topic becomes material, becomes risky. For IAS 19, we have heard positive reactions by the preparers on the proposals of in this ED, but also uh, concerns uh, to er, around the costs and the process to be put in place, in particular to document for auditors and enforcers to do their job, how the entity has selected a given information. We have heard the support to keep the sensitivity information in the uh, financial statements and also to look at the diversity of different plans that exist and not only to the UK type uh, uh, plans. From an auditor's perspective on IAS 19, uh, we have heard that uh, um, it, it could be good to have an illustrative guidance on how the thought process uh, uh, for selecting the disclosure has to be uh, applied. And from an actuary perspective, uh, it has been said that it will be challenging in the short time to prepare the financial statement, and there will be pressure uh, how to define the process with the auditor. So there will be a process element also here to be agreed very, very much in, in upfront. There was no support for the range of possible possible values perceived to be very costly, but also in contradiction with the idea of the best estimate. And also the current quantitative information was perceived to be useful and quite uh, appropriate. Uh, a very, very simple word on IFRS 13, from a banking perspective, it was challenging to imagine uh, these, these, these disclosures as appropriate when an entity has a huge amount of uh, items measured at fair value. There was also a concern about commercial sensitivity to provide granular information and also the usefulness concerns around how useful it is to disclose the fair value for loans that are not monitored to be uh, disposed. Uh, also concerns about the cost implications, the implication of the senior managers uh, in the process of selecting the disclosure and this also uh, uh, may result in a practical challenge. Um, again, from the auditor's perspective, it was mentioned uh, that uh, it would be very important to have uh, uh, details about the borderline between level two and level three. Uh, and also from the cost benefit perspective, it was mentioned that the post implementation uh, review of 13 was showing that the, uh, the disclosure was overall working very well. So there is, I'm sure, a lot much to be said, and you will have the opportunity to read in our feedback report. Uh, uh, so I take the occasion to, to thanks a lot, to, to thank a lot to Francoise Flores to be here, uh, together also with Catherine from the ISB staff. Thank you, Michael, uh, for your excellent job as a moderator. Thank you to all the panelists for the uh, uh, high quality and richness of the debate that we had. And we are looking forward for comment letters and also for preparers that want to join the field test. We need your input. Thanks a lot and have a good day.